Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about educating the next generation of law enforcement officers with guests, Noel Marsh, a lecturer of Justice Studies at the University of Maine at Augusta, Johnny Reddick, adjunct faculty at uh, University of San Diego, Obed uh, Manji, police officer of the Sacramento Police Department, who is assigned to the Professional Standards Unit and an adjunct professor at Brandman University, and Ramona Prieto, retired deputy commissioner with the California Highway Patrol and a Deadly Force Review Board member with the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Thank you all. It is so wonderful to have such a renowned panel. Uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am that you would take the time to help educate uh, people who depend on you and depend on your colleagues, but really don't know enough about your work. And, and uh, in particular at this moment of time when lack of communication is just endemic here in the United States, it's, it's, it's just a great service that you're providing. So just sort of to kick, a, to kick our, uh, us off, you know, we all know and we all depend on the fact that law enforcement is so important to a civil society and there are concerns within and outside of the law enforcement community about how law enforcement is shaping up and how perceptions are shaping up in, in, in the country. So it would be great to just sort of go around this virtual table and just have you comment on your view of the state of relations uh, in communities and within the law enforcement community uh, in terms of, of how people see the, the state of affairs in law enforcement. Let's start with you, Noel. Sure, Mark, thank you very much. So I've been in this line of work for nearly 40 years as an officer, a police chief, a United States Marshal, and now I'm a, an educator. So I was a player and now I'm a coach. And what I look at, as well as being a member of the board of directors for the International Association of Chiefs of Police, is a national perspective of communication, perception, and, um, and, and relationships. Look, we have 18,000, approximately 18,000 police departments in the United States around 700 plus thousand police officers. So when we're talking about police and community relationships, trust, credibility, legitimacy, communication, the small town that we think of when we think of Andy Griffith is a completely different environment than New York City, where we have a far greater degree of anonymity with our police officers and the citizens and community members with which they work. And so it's a broad question but clearly the events of this past year have shown a bright light on the ever increasing and important need to cultivate and maintain trust, two-way flow of communication and understanding between our police and our public. And the circumstance that you point out is so, is so critical that we're not talking about law enforcement as a generic monolith in which you can sort of imprint on all law enforcement uh, functions and all law enforcement professionals, the same type of solutions. The solutions that are developed have to be informed by uh, communities, don't they, Johnny? They do. And so, you know, Noel hit on some very important parts of the capacity for this space for us to be able to have relationships. And so um, relational policing is something that I think we don't understand from maybe the community side, that policing is really about policing our communities as a whole. And the divisiveness um, that we're seeing in society on us versus them is, uh, is a place that is really broken. And it's broken down, just like Noel said, the communication aspects of how we are here to serve. And so there is a Pew research study that shows that um, roughly 93% of our police officers their largest concern is their safety because what this conversation has created is created them to be against the community. And so they fear for their safety when they're out there policing. And for your audience that we're speaking to, hopefully we're gonna share some things that we're doing in policing to work on education, community, building trust, legitimacy, and all of those things. But really the message is we are all in this together. And so it's collaboration with our community partners and policing leadership and leaders in cities that are really gonna make the difference as we're moving forward to build this better society. 
I'm really worried about the psychological toll it takes when, when your motivation is primarily to serve others. And yet in, in, in that service at this moment, because of, of really bad circumstances and, and they're bad truths as well, that uh, somehow that service is, is not respected, is doubted, the motivations are doubted. Uh, Obed, what do you observe in terms of, uh, of that dynamic and how it affects officers? Uh, well, thank you for having me on. Uh, there's a lot of dynamics at play. So on the one end, everybody who wants to become a police officer is doing it because there is a sense of service and wanting to provide you know, safety and being a part of the community. Uh, unfortunately, that's come under fire today because the way we do things in policing hasn't caught up with the 21st century. As a profession, we're very traditional, uh, we're very reactive. And what happens is when there's some structural deficiencies in the profession, we, those of us who are on the front lines, suffer the consequences. So when you see the uniform, it's, hey, that's government. We don't see who's wearing the uniform. We don't know who that person is and so on and so forth. So now you have a situation where I'm a police officer and my city, I perceive, doesn't appreciate me. And I've got a city government, whether it's city council in some areas or whatever it is, that don't appreciate me. And so if I'm in a situation where I'm not appreciated, would I be motivated to come to work every day? Probably not. In any profession, you're gonna find that to be, you know, to be the norm. So there is this sense that yes, we're being held, you know, we're being held to a higher standard and we should be held to a higher standard. But the way we do policing, the way we go about it has to be held to that standard. And if we don't meet that metric, those, you know, the public is gonna hold policing accountable. And sometimes, you know, as you see today, everybody's in their silos and everyone's talking past each other. And nobody's talking with or collaborating with each other. So that's a lot of what's going on that's contributing to, you know, some of the angst that's going on there right now. And, I, and, and it seems to me that there are uh, cultural issues that need to be uh, addressed on, on uh, each side. Ramona, your, your uh, background is so fascinating to me because you're very much a woman of firsts. Um, could you just sort of describe um, what you encountered and, and the firsts that you forged uh, for other uh, officers uh, and, and sort of opening the way of, uh, of service and, and how you feel that the culture needs to adjust and has adjusted over the time, but might, but, uh, but might still need to adjust. So, um, I, I think there's a lot of really good points that were brought up here and some that I've lived. Like um, I, I also have uh, almost 40 years in law enforcement and now I teach across the United States and Canada and we talk about police legitimacy and trust, but there's this theory that's out there that I think is so important and, and it addresses some of the things that were brought up already. It's called the contact theory. So if I'm a woman and say I'm a motorcycle officer, what is your snap response? You see a woman and you see a motorcycle officer. Well, back about 30 years ago, those two uh, concepts didn't go together. So a lot of us carry around what some people call implicit bias. And it's a bias that we don't even know that it's happening. If I tell you salt, you say pepper because it's things that are connected in your mind. Well, in a lot of people's minds back in the day, they didn't see a woman and a motor officer. Maybe they didn't see a woman and a deputy commissioner or a woman and a commander of an entire area. But, but I think to break down those barriers, it's a contact theory. Let me tell you about me and I want to know about you. It's not a one-way street. We have to appreciate, not just tolerate, but appreciate what everybody brings to the table because we're all in this together. We're all rowing the boat. We don't want to shoot holes in the canoe that we're in because we're all going to sink. We have to appreciate. We have to get to understand. And I think when we hit that understanding piece, then it's better for everybody. People don't have this mistrust because they know what we're all about. They know what we're doing. And likewise, we know what they're doing. I have to tell you that sometimes, you know, after being quite a few years in law enforcement, you see things that are happening throughout the country. Like some departments have ice cream trucks. I'm like, why, why does a police department have an ice cream truck? They said, man, you go to a project and you give out free ice creams. The kids come out, the parents come out. Now that's something I would have never thought about. Those two things aren't connected in my mind. But I mean, it just goes to show you out there that police agencies are evolving to try to get into the communities, to try to be more active in the communities, to try to build that trust and build that bridge. Now, when you were, when you were a, 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 a motorcycle officer um, and you encountered this sort of surprise, um, how did you deal with it? 
so um, I had a little edge because I grew up. Let me shut this off. I grew up in San Francisco, and um, I grew up with all brothers. And so my parents would always say, "Hey, just go figure it out." I said, "Well, you know, they're being mean to me out there." He'd say, they say, "Just go figure it out." So when I'd get pulled, when I'd pull somebody over, and they'd say, "Oh my God, are you a woman?" I'd say, "Yeah." And the reason I stopped you is blah blah blah, and the whole t- they could care less if I was taking them to jail, writing them a ticket, or just having a conversation. A lot of them were surprised that one of them even got on a call box and said, there's somebody out here impersonating an officer. I, I don't know if you know this, but there's a woman out here. And, and I was just like, wow. I, you know, I, I thought it was kind of strange myself, but um, that people would call in because you know, I'm from San Francisco, pretty liberal there. And um, I worked a lot in the Los Angeles area, which I thought was liberal as well. But, you know, um, people carry around with them their experiences and the things they believe in. And that's not good, bad or indifferent. It's just something we deal with. And I think if you can, um, if your first blush is to deal with it with grace, but be ready to move forward in another direction if you have to, because we all, you know, we all grew up with different experiences. Yeah, I, I guess that it, it comes down to what does an officer look like? Right. What does an officer look like? Um, anyone want to comment? What does an officer look like? No? What does an officer look like? An officer looks like the uniform at first blush. What uh, Ramona just mentioned about that blink response, that, that first uh, initial impression from your own conditioning, that, um, gosh, it's, it's really something because regardless of gender or race or otherwise, it's that uniform that represents a certain thing in all of us. We all have a certain feeling about teachers and parents and police authority figures growing up. And, you know, that uniform has an awful heavy burden. There is a, a, a Garda, an Irish National Police uh, constable who once said that uh, the, um, be mindful of um, how you carry yourself because your uniform is talking all the time, even though you're not saying a word. And um, I was first told back in 1980 when I became a police officer that, um, you know, the police officer is the first one you look for, but the last one you want to meet. And that carries with a very special stigma. And I use the word stigma in society. And it's up to each individual officer to overcome that. And it's not easy to do because we don't have a second chance to make a first impression as police officers. And you represent these 700,000 in this profession for that individual, that citizen for perhaps forever. Uh, it's important to, uh, to appreciate and be self-aware, not self-conscious of uh, how you're presenting and representing the profession of public trust as a uniformed police officer. Oh, but what is a, what is a white police officer look like to uh, a African-American man um, who, who might be confronting that person either in a, in, in a friendly or not so friendly way? Well, the short answer would be, it depends on the individual, but in many communities, many black communities, uh, they see the white officer as the oppressor. They see the white officer as somebody who's coming in to, you know, ruin their lives and to undermine the community as somebody who's an occupier. Uh, This is what I hear from a lot of my friends. And obviously we know that most police officers are doing the best job that they can to keep communities safe. And as you know, I run my own consulting company called Magni Leadership where we provide emotional intelligence training to police officers and law enforcement agencies so that they can keep their officers and the community safe. And the reason why I say that is because it doesn't, it shouldn't have to matter if you're white, black, Puerto Rican, whatever it is. And, you know, something, you know, to the point that Noel brought up, you know, with police officers being the last person you want to see, I think there's a bigger issue here with this warrior versus guardian mentality where we have too many officers in many of these communities with this warrior mindset where it's kind of like you're at war and you know everybody is out to get you. So you know, you're kind of like seeing everyone as an enemy or an other, as opposed to seeing them as your neighbor or like the neighborhood florist or the neighborhood garbage person or somebody who works in you know HR block or something like that. And we need more officers, we need more emotional intelligence training. Uh, so that officers can communicate effectively with people in the community. And, you know, Johnny brought up, you know, some statistics, and I'll give you another one, which is more of an unfortunate one, I should say. Um, If you look across the country with 18,000 police departments, probably less, and I'm giving you a conservative number, but probably less than 5%, if that, have any type of emotional intelligence training anyways. And what is it that most police officers are dealing with on a daily basis? People who are having a bad day. People who might be angry with them for whatever reason. And being a police officer, you got to be able to be resilient, manage that stress, 
so that you don't find yourself escalating a situation when you encounter somebody who may have an adversarial attitude towards you. You know, maybe it's something that's related to their trauma that they're dealing with. And you gotta be able to recognize those things. So again, to your question, um, for a lot of black folks, especially communities of color, they don't see the white police officer as their friend or as a neighbor. And that's a problem. And I'd like to weigh in, if you don't mind, Mark, on the um, educational piece for our law enforcement. So uh, for me, I'm an adjunct at the University of San Diego, but I also adjunct at one of our uh, Commission on Peace Officers Standards and Trainings um, academies at our junior college. So I work with cadets. And um, as you know, I have 29 years in law enforcement and Ms. Mona Prieto is my hero because I worked in the same organization and she paved the way for myself and many other women. And so part of that training and development that we do inside the organization starts with those cadets when they come in. So for post here in California, they give you know over 664 hours. There's like 40 to 42 learning domains. Um, these are the foundation for most of our uh, law enforcement officers that come in. And then when you go to an agency, you can get anywhere upwards of an additional four or 500 hours of agency specific training. And so what Obed is talking about is this space and this gap where we give a lot of training to officer safety and tactics and things of that nature. And we're starting to implement more of things like Mona mentioned, implicit bias, principal policing, procedural justice, um, emotional intelligence, which has, which has to do with your own self-awareness and understanding you know, relationship management and social awareness of others, kind of empathy, being in somebody else's shoes. And so we're starting to integrate that type of training as well as you talked earlier about the health and mental health of our employees, but mindfulness and practice having to do with wellness, which is another huge factor that affects our, uh, our law enforcement officers. So it is important how we bring them in at the foundation and where we take them through as officers, but more needs to be done in this space between coming on and having initial training throughout the rest of their career. And of course, leadership building um, throughout the organization. We just finished a uh, poll, Johnny, uh, in which we, uh, we asked, it just, it just actually disappeared from my screen. We asked um, what kind of changes uh, were required in, the, uh, in, in, in law enforcement. Training was, was very high uh, on, on this. Um, it's, it's interesting, um, that, that idea of counseling, um, uh, uh, training, uh, that seemed to have garnered the most votes. Um, more resource, just simply throwing money at the problem, was not a popular um, choice, as well as, and this was very interesting, only 18% of people uh, felt that, that the, um, the role of officers should be uh, more limited. Uh, that's really interesting because we've been talking about uh, shifting the roles of law enforcement. It's gotten a lot of currency but not a lot of uh, votes in, in uh, the particular attendee group that we have here. Johnny, I wanna go back to a point that you and I had discussed offline, and that is about the recruitment of officers and this idea that, that uh, uh, Obed uh, brought up about the warrior versus protector uh, issue. In terms of recruiting uh, police officers, it seems that the culture is formed um, at the point of recruiting in part, and, and the question that I have is, is in recruiting, um, what are the constituents from which new recruits are drawn? For, uh, and, and what are the messages that are provided in the recruiting process uh, that sort of sets the initial expectation and the initial culture of incoming classes? Um, so for most law enforcement recruiting, um, traditionally, and again, um, you know, I've been retired a few years, 29 years. So when I came on, it was very similar to kind of how it was probably the last few years and it's starting to shift, but it's paramilitary organization, right? So generally what you present out in your campaigns or your posters is almost military type recruiting. You have um, individuals with police cars, guns, canines, the helicopter, all these specialized positions. And what is, and we generally would recruit also from the military, right? 
And so now, and I, I worked in recruitment for a lot of years. Um, and one of the things that we continually try to do and what recruitment in all agencies are trying to do is to really find the candidate who's about service, right? Because this is a very honorable and noble profession. And so we wanna have people who have the aptitude, have this emotional uh, capacity to be able to do the work. And so it's almost moved from just a criminal justice type of a major to even those that may be in some of the um, sociology, they may be in speech and debate, they can be in all kinds of things in your call in your collegiate network, right? And so we're trying to open up that mindset, but it's how we market and how we appeal to what we do. And in the climate that we're in, most people don't want to come into policing because of the fractured um, community version of how you see us as well as policing itself has some issues and challenges internally in the organization. So recruitment, everybody's struggling with it. There are statistics out there that show law enforcement is down from um, the last decade and that people are retiring or leaving law enforcement for different jobs. And it is so difficult to get people interested and we want quality people. And so quality could mean Recruitment needs to think about how they're gonna prepare applicants to actually come into an academy, how they're gonna come into an organizational culture. So they might have to put some pre-programs together to get people up to speed to get in. And you're right, they do get um, exposed to the culture through the way we campaign and recruit. And if we want different type of people in our organization, we're going to have to change that in policing. But we need the community, Mark. We need the community to understand that we cannot do it by ourselves. If I want to be able to create diversity, equity, and inclusion in my organization, I need help from my community partners to help me find the right people, the best people, good people to come into the department. Are there, are there attributes that eliminate really great or, or criteria that eliminate really great um, uh, pot potential recruits? Um, you know, we, we were talking a little bit um, uh, offline about the whole idea of uh, certain criteria. Uh, if you look at the changes in the marijuana laws, for example, uh, somebody who previously was busted um, for possessing marijuana in a state that is now where it's legal, um, you know, does that does that really eliminate that person or that or that group of people from um, from being an officer? Uh, tax issues or or other issues. Um, what what are your comments in terms of the um, the filtering systems? Uh, for recruits, uh, no. It's, it's so difficult without a crystal ball. We still don't have that yet. We have a polygraph, a lie detector test that helps us verify a person's truthfulness. And when we're hiring, we, we're looking for the person who's going to tell us the truth, even about the things that they would rather their parents not know. And <laughs> yeah, we have evolved in terms of our understanding and appreciation for that. It's, it's a rare thing to find an applicant who has not at least tried recreationally marijuana, for example. And so the times are changing. And so we're, we're making that adjustment. We can't compromise on integrity and honesty. Um, and also physical fitness, basic levels of physical fitness. The irony though, Mark, is that we often will put someone through a you know, mile and a half run in 12 minutes or whatever their age is, maybe 10 minutes, and jumping over a wall. But we never test them or require them to be physically fit proficient after that. And we end up with um, health issues, workers' comp issues, and the like. So I think that what, uh, um, what Johnny had just said about uh, hiring for a spirit of service rather than a spirit of adventure, we have plenty of action heroes looking for people who truly embody that, uh, as Ovid said, the um, uh, wanting to help and make a difference attitude towards public service. Is, is the thing. But you know, we attract the people that look like us. It's human nature. And so if it's a very organized military organization, you're going to attract more height and tight haircut military type applicants. But if it's more um, connected with the community, you might attract more connected with the community personalities. And uh, Mark, we weighed in on mental health training. Um, uh, Ramona, could you talk about um, mental health training in your, in your uh, view, you know, um, Noel talked about physical training and then a lapse in physical training, right? So that we end up with healthy people coming in, 
but down the road we might uh, we might end up with unhealthy uh, officers, which which are just a hazard to themselves and, and can be a hazard to others. But mental health uh, issues are also endemic. If you're a first responder, you are going to suffer trauma on a daily basis, and that absolutely. Accumul- Absolutely. You know, back when I was with the Higher Patrol, I helped spearhead um, a a program regarding mental illness on our department for 11,000 officers. And it was about having peer support because maybe um, back in the day, we weren't used to just going and trying to have some type of mental health therapy. But now if your partner sees you come in every day and happens to notice that something's just not right with that person, maybe to pull you aside and find out what's going on, maybe try to shepherd you over to where you can get help. Because when you're on the front lines, you see a lot of things. And, um, you know, sometimes we watch TV and we see, wow, they solve all the problems in 30 minutes or they walk away like nothing happened. But that's not real life. In real life, we're human beings and we have feelings and those feelings sometimes overwhelm us with things that are going on in our world. So I think mental health training is imperative. I also teach with International Association of Chiefs of Police and one of the, the programs, we have a whole section on mindfulness, wellness, and how to take care of not only physical fitness, but also how to take care of yourself because you're the number one commodity that for you to continue on, you have to be in a good place to help others. You can't help others if you're not in a good place. And uh, Johnny, I didn't mean to, to uh, cut you off because I saw you, you, were, uh, you were starting to say something. Well, I noticed the question also was asking about also the response to uh, um, citizens who have mental illness and for policing and some of the concerns with that. And, you know, there is a lot of training that takes place at the cadet level. Um, We have classes that um, deal with people with disabilities and mental illness is also covered as well as crisis intervention teams. Um, You know, that all that training has been put into place in the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. It has been evolving and trained on how you respond to people with mental illness. So our officers have awareness, um, you know, uh, better communication, better understanding to know that maybe they're not going to respond the same as somebody who doesn't have a mental illness. And so I just wanted to be real direct in the sense that there is training for that. Our officers do know how to respond. It is unfortunate the incidents that have happened, but you know, there is continual work in evolution of understanding and communication and response to those type of incidents. And there needs to be two, two way um, understanding. Oh, but sorry about that. Go, go ahead. No, uh, one of the other things too is, so I'm a big proponent of evidence-based policing and that's looking for the most effective ways to you know, respond to calls for service or anything in policing uh, that doesn't cause any harm to the community. And what we don't have enough of in policing is a lot of our training and a lot of our policies and procedures based on the best available data and based on scientific research. Now, again, I'm not saying that to be an end all be all, but you know, one of the other reasons why there's so much distrust of policing is because there's a perception that we don't use the most objective measures uh, when it comes to responding to calls and so on and so forth. So to Johnny's point, you know, there is some training going on with the Highway Patrol and maybe some other agencies. Unfortunately, there's this belief that everybody's doing it and everybody is not doing it. So what happens in one agency in one state, if somebody does something that doesn't look good, affects everybody everywhere else. So that's just something to keep in mind that we do need, you know, more evidence-based policing um, in the profession. Yeah, so- and the evidence-based policing is, is one of the things too regarding the national standard for police training. I mean, that's not, no, you could probably lean into this one that that's the conversation being had is looking at how to standardize some policing practices and policies across our country because we do have different states and different agencies that operate differently sometimes than other ones. We still have police agencies that only require a high school diploma. And if you're big and strong and brave, those are the requirements to be a police officer. Well, that's still true for firefighters. But these days, um, look, our teachers, our nurses, I mean, other professions require a higher education degree and annual in-service CEU continuing education to maintain your license. That is not a constant standard across this country today and it should be. I'm not just saying that from a university chair here. I'm saying it from the fact that our profession has, and the expectations of it have evolved and are so complex now that uh, we need to expect more in terms of professional development and higher education. 
Uh, we're coming to the end of our time. I wanted to get your comments on, uh, on two aspects. Um, a lot of these, um, uh, these issues have um, worked their way through society with a polarized um, uh, question uh, encapsulated by this idea of defund the police, which doesn't necessarily mean defunding. It's not a literal uh, idea. It's the movement of resources. Uh, but I would like to just sort of get your view of sort of this, this idea um, and, and the opposition to the idea of, of this. And let's just go around the table um, because when, when we did the poll, when we asked about defunding the police, um, basically uh, there, was, there was all sorts of confusion in the answers. Some people felt that it would do more harm than good. Some people felt that, it, that the, these, these policies would do more good than harm. Some people thought both. Some people said, I'm not sure. So let's just go around, around the room um, and, and let's uh, start off with, uh, with Noel and we'll end up with uh, Ramona. Um, what do you think about, about this, whole, this whole response and, and how should we actually uh, deal with the difficulties that we've been discussing throughout this show? Thank you for bringing this up, Mark, because it's so important to understand if we're going to defund something, it suggested it was funded in the first place, and it wasn't. The workload was foisted upon the shoulders of homelessness, addiction, family violence, um, the juvenile issues. The, the list is long because those social services, social services were defunded along the way. And it's not like resources went to police to address this. Um, the defund the police is, is it, it seems more punitive than it does sound to me to be progressive. The funding of alternative sources and co-produced public safety, looking at this as a, a public health uh, mission together where we, we jointly address societal um, issues and social disorder, multidisciplinary. You don't, listen, there are enough, um, there's been defunding of the police going on for years in budget cuts and resource um, resources being lost. Uh, that is not helpful. I'm speaking from someone who's been involved in this for a long, long time. And reassigning priorities to um, other social service and first responders other than just the police, just like our jails, shouldn't be our mental health intake. Uh, centers we haven't funded properly in the first place. So what you're saying is that is that 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 all the societal ills that are falling on the shoulders of the, of, of law enforcement, that those ills, whether you buy into the warrior culture or the protector culture, right, all these ills don't attach to either side of that equation, right? I mean, you know, mental health issues um, is about healing. Uh, law enforcement officers are not necessarily equipped to diagnose and then heal and treat, right? So, so what you're saying is that we, we basically shoveled so many social ills onto the shoulders of law enforcement and we don't resource it appropriately and, and people are just sort of managing the, as best they can. We really need to stop, take a breath and talk to each other and figure it out. Johnny, how do you see this, this whole issue of defunding or, or um, and, and it's, it is a deceptive term. We just got a comment on that. It is absolutely deceptive. But in terms of the, 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 uh, the policies that are surrounding that. So, you know, the, the policies surrounding it for one or one thing, but I think the biggest concern that I have for this is this immediate reaction to think that money will change outcomes and where the money comes and it's shifted will change outcomes without real thought. And so when I teach at the University of San Diego, it is a graduate level program with executive public safety and law enforcement leaders from across the country that are in this program. And we are talking um, these, you know, very contemporary national issues and this concern with removing resources from policing to be able to go out and do basic elements of what law enforcement needs to do, which Noel touched on. We have, we have been underfunded for decades. And now you're talking about taking additional funding to place it somewhere that's going to be, something's going to be done with it with no real plan. That's a problem to me. And so to me, 
there needs to be better thought in how we're going to collaboratively work with our stakeholders. And one of the things we talk about is in a couple of states, the homelessness issue and how working with your city council can be like, you know, butting heads because you don't see the same way that law enforcement does on how we need to address the addiction versus the crime maybe in these populations. And that's just speaking of homelessness. And so there just needs to be better discussion. There needs to be a longer and better plan, but taking money from one bucket to another is a disservice to the community. And I don't think they realize it until it's gonna happen in some of those cities where they're actually doing that now. So your point is that you have to aim before you shoot. We're taught that, yes. If you wanna hit the target and have a tight grouping. <laughs> Otherwise there might be collateral damage, right? Yes. Ovid, what do you think about this whole uh, issue? Defining your terms, defining your terms. As somebody who's co-chaired and chaired dissertation committees at Brandman University, one of the first questions that I ask my students whenever they're like, hey, I wanna do this research on this, or I wanna do my dissertation on that, is what is the definition of success? And what happens is they give me their definition of what success looks like. I'm like, cool, what do your stakeholders think? And it's the, oh, I didn't think about that. So as we're talking about citizens, right? Right. So we're talking about defunding the police. We haven't even defined what defunding the police mean. So if I ask one group of people, they'll say to, you know, everybody here, we understand ish that it's, hey, reallocating resources, you know, maybe taking the you know, responsibilities that are placed on police officers and putting them over here where we have more social workers. That's one definition. But to another group of people, it's abolishing the police. It's blow the system up. Let's start from scratch. So we're still trying to figure out what defund actually means and to who are we talking to or what? So we're all over the place with this. But <clears throat> for the sake of this conversation, I'm totally okay with the reallocation of resources, of what is being placed on police officers, being shouldered to other people. Mike Brown, former chief of Dallas PD, had this you know, famous speech where you know, he was talking about, man, you know what, if your dog's out there running around, Call the police, they'll handle it. Oh, you got a hangnail? Call the police, they'll handle it. Oh, you walking down the street and your roommate came by and took your headphones? Call the police, they'll handle it. So the police are being overburdened with so many responsibilities and that's adding to stress, doing more with less on steroids and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's everybody's point. Yeah, I'm totally okay with not necessarily defunding the police like, hey, let's just leave them on their own and take everything away from them. It's again, being responsible, using evidence-based policing practices where it's like, hey, what is the most efficient and effective way to address public safety? Where we don't put all the responsibility on the police, where everybody plays, uh, everybody has a responsibility in solving whatever those issues are. Figure out what works best and then do that, right? Absolutely, so that everybody's on the same page and you don't have one group you know, speaking for another group and then everyone's not understanding what's going on here because if we don't understand what it is that we're doing or what the actual issue is, if we don't know what the question is, we're never gonna get a coherent answer. Ramona, um, I, I'm so interested in, in giving you the last word because in the, in the midst of frustrating experiences, which we've all had in our careers, it's sometimes, um, uh, it's sometimes attractive to just say, throw the whole thing out and let's start all over again. How do you feel about this? You know, I, I really agree with what's been said already. I think defining the role of police and where we start, because we're trying to shrink some of the police responsibilities, but yet we're lumping together, hey, police, you got to take care of mental illness. You got to take care of homelessness. You got to take care of poverty on the streets. And, and when you just look at our society right now, the very largest mental illness institution in the United States is the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Jail. So when you think about that, you think, wow, so the police have to take care of that. 
are they the best equipped to take care of that? Maybe not. So maybe a, a discussion on what are the redistributing things that we can do to take some of the responsibilities away that maybe would be better suited somewhere else. And maybe a robust training program, because I think we all kind of hearken to the fact that for us to change, we need to collaborate with the community, find out what it is we can provide the best service, and then train, 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 train. Because law enforcement's changed and it continues to evolve. And for us to be on the cutting edge, we have to make sure that we're providing the best services that we can. And how do we do that? We train. Here, here. You know, uh... It is, it, this has been such a productive discussion. I know it's very short. We could probably do five shows on, on just these topics alone, but I wanna thank you all for, uh, for helping to uh, educate uh, people like myself. Uh, Noel March, lecturer of justice studies at University of Maine at Augusta, Joni, uh, Johnny, <laughs> Johnny Reddick, uh, adjunct faculty at the University of San Diego, uh, Omid uh, Manji um, uh, of the Sacramento Police Department, and assigned to the uh, Professional Standards Unit, and Ramona Prieto, um, deputy retired Deputy Commissioner with the ha California Highway Patrol and, the, and, the, and a Deadly Force Review Board member with the California Department of Corrections and Rehab. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. This is such an important issue. Uh, we'll probably be uh, asking you to come on again in about a year uh, because the only way we're going to make change is to disseminate information, engage in a dialogue, and figure out solutions, perhaps compromise solutions, but solutions that, that uh, push the ball forward. Thank you all. That's the Nonprofit Report. Everybody stay safe, mask up, and we'll see you again next Tuesday.